What is your kryptonite? Now, not to be confused with your cryptocurrency, if you have any of that. Kryptonite was that thing that could weaken and strip my cartoon hero, Superman, from his strength and his ability to fight the fight, to fight the good fight. What about you? If you're a believer, you're in the fight for your life, whether you know it or not. And maybe this morning you sense that you're struggling. You're being attacked. You're defeated in a certain area of your life. That area, that thing being your kryptonite cripples you every time. We can easily get lulled into a spiritual sleep and forget that we are at war. We have an enemy. And if you take a minute to think about it, you feel it, you know it, you experience it, and you know it's true. But sometimes we forget that the reason there is such a struggle is that we have an enemy that's out to get us. And his goal, sole purpose in your life is to kill you, steal from you, destroy you. That's what he wants for you. And the greatest trick of the devil is that he has convinced the world that he doesn't exist. But evil does exist. And before we can win the battle on a daily basis, there has to be a recognition of the strength and the strategy of the enemy. Because half the time, we're fighting the wrong battles. Sometimes we're fighting each other. That's the wrong battle. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, he says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. And that's why in the same chapter, he talks about putting on the armor of God. You don't put on the armor if you're going to the playground, right? You put on the armor because you're going to battle, you're going to war. And this morning, we want to unpack the war a little bit because when you're on the offensive, and many of you are, many of you have jumped into these rooted groups uh, in our church, and, and you know what? That's being on the offensive. You're gathering with God's people. You're growing together. You're praying together. You're going to serve together. And you know what? When you start doing that, the enemy's going to turn up the heat, and you're feeling it. You've likely experienced that truth. So I want to pray for us, and then we're going to unpack this a little bit together. Father, we thank you again for the opportunity we have to be in this place, for you to be teaching us through your word. We thank you for the the opportunity to worship that we've had, just such a beautiful time of lifting up your name. And so I pray that today as we go to battle with information about Satan and his, his strategy and what we can do about it, I pray, Lord, that you will open our hearts and minds to your word, bring to the surface those areas of our lives that, Father, you want to have us yield to today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, good morning. good morning. I just want to first say I love Pastor Brett. <laughs> it's great to be here with you this morning. I'm Pastor Don. I'm the campus pastor at the east side of town and really glad that we're here. So we want to talk about what this war is all about. First of all, we think about what we're up against. What are we up against here in this battle that we have? The spiritual war for believers is coming at us on three fronts. And all of them call us eventually to disobedience and sinful behaviors and sinful thoughts. The first of those fronts that we're going to look at is the world. You've heard these terms before, the world, the flesh, and the devil. We're going to talk about them. The first is the world. First John chapter 2, it says in verse 15, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, he describes what he's talking about. The cravings of sinful man, selfishness, the lust of the flesh. Secondly, the lust of the eyes and the boasting of what he has or does, what we call the pride of life, comes not from the Father but from the world. He's not talking about the world in which we live, like you can't love flowers and trees and oceans and sunsets, and that's not what he's talking about. The world in the New Testament often refers to a place which is hostile to God. It's a source of moral corruption, a danger to the spiritual health and life of believers, and that matches up with what I've experienced. I don't know about you. 
and are fighting against this idea of the world. And he kind of breaks it down into three places. Number one, the lust of the flesh. Selfishness. Now, almost every Facebook post that I read is about the one posting. Not all, but often it's about the one posting, right? And then when we comment, have you ever noticed, just kind of play that, if you ever look at the comments aren't even about the post that's about the person who's commenting. They got to tell you how they can relate to your situation or that they also just bought a new car. And so we have to endure your family vacation pictures. We have to endure the pics of your new car or hear about how you totally understand our pain, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because it's all about you. It's all about me. I just likely got unfriended by half of you. It's okay. (laughs) Selfishness. We're about ourselves. Secondly, the lust of the eyes. The most dangerous medium that can draw us away from our walk with Jesus, I think, is the eye gate. It gets flashier all the time. It gets prettier all the time. It gets more enticing all the time. And it's all about trying to get you and me to lust and to covet after men and women and cars and houses and clothing and furniture and home decor. The lust of the eyes and the pride of life are simply pride. What I have and what I do. We don't even know how to be authentic with each other anymore. We don't know how to tell the truth. We come here on Sunday mornings and we actually put on a little bit of an airs. People really don't know what's going on behind that makeup, that nicely dressed man, or that wonderful looking family. We inflate our accomplishments, we exaggerate the numbers. What's that about? Pride. The pride of life. It's a powerful force to be reckoned with. And what we sometimes think is that if we can isolate ourselves from this thing called the world that has this power of the eyes and of the flesh and of selfishness and pride, if we could just isolate ourselves from it and keep away from it, that would be the, that would be the answer, right? And we take our kids and we put them in our, our bubbles and we don't let them out of our sight because we have to protect them from all those evil things that are out there. And some have tried this. They've gone to the mountains and they've lived on their own in a cabin or in the monasteries because they were trying to separate themselves from the world in order that they could become holy. Here's the problem. It's not the only thing that we're battling. It's not the only thing that we're battling. Because the second thing that he tells us is that we are battling the inner me. We have the enemy and then we have the inner me, the flesh. During World War 1812, the United States Navy defeated the British Navy. The Battle of Lake Erie and the commander wrote to the Major General and said, we have met the enemy and they are us. So people try to insulate themselves from the world only to find out that they actually are the problem. The most continual, aggressive enemy the Christian has is the flesh. Matthew Henley rewrote this, sin is a brat which nobody is willing to own up to. It's that part of you that wants to blame somebody else. It's really not my fault. And the struggle's real. Not long ago, we were going through the book of Romans, and in Romans chapter 7, I want to just read these verses again for you. It's, it's a tongue twister, so hang on. Verses 14 to 20. Paul writes, We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do I do not do, but what I hate I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but the sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have desired to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good that I want to do. No, the evil that I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do not do what I do not, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin living in me that does it. Hello? <laughs> What is Paul saying? I'm going to wrap it up real simply. Paul is saying, the flesh has a memory. The flesh has a memory. Man, I remember, I still do it. I still remember it because it's so fresh in my mind, as recent as Thanksgiving. I go to my, my in-law's home and 
My mother-in-law puts an apple pie in the oven, and I'm smelling it, right, the whole time. And then she brings that warm apple pie out, and I have a big slice of warm apple pie with big, two big vanilla bean Telemook ice cream <laughs> right on top. Oh, man. I enjoy that. It's good. Three hours later, what happens? Mm, I'm going back into that kitchen, and I think I need another piece of pie with some ice cream on top, and I have a good night's sleep, and I wake up in the morning. What do I have for breakfast? An apple pie <laughs> with some ice cream on top. You know why? Because the flesh remembers. My taste buds remember that I really liked that. I'm going to do it again, and I keep going back, and I keep going back, and I keep going back. And the flesh remembers the euphoria of sinful moments where the Bible says it's pleasant for a season. Listen, it wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't fun, if it didn't feel good. And there's a reality that we're in Christ. Our identity is in him. And yet we still live in a fallen world and our flesh has not yet been redeemed and glorified. So we fight against that. It's a daily battle. And the inner me has the potential for sin calls to me to leave the path of righteousness to forget what it is that I know to be true at times and follow my old ways. And I fight against the world and the flesh. And thirdly, the devil, the enemy himself. John chapter 8, he is a murderer from the beginning, not holding the truth. For there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. He prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking who he might devour. Here's your enemy's resume, and it's just a short list of many. First Peter 5, he is our adversary. Here in John 8, he's a liar. Same passage, he's a murderer. He seeks to kill us. Ephesians chapter 2, he's the ruler of the kingdom of the air. So there are times when Satan himself or his minions, the de demonic world that he took with him from heaven, they come at you personally. And he's not made, a, this isn't a character made up in our stories. He is real. He is current. And he is on the move to kick the legs right out from under you if he could. And so we have to beware. That's what we're up against. The world. The world system all around us and everything that that means. The flesh. The inner me. The flesh that remembers. And the devil himself. But what is his strategy What's the strategy here? What does he do to try to draw us away? Here's a couple of things I want us to think about. There are a lot more, I'm sure, but I just want to give you three. The first thing I think that he does, one of the things that he does is he seeks to distract us. He seeks to distract us. You know, Samson was an amazing man, a Nazarite. You remember one of the judges of Israel? Samson was given this extraordinary amount of strength where he was able to fight against the Philistines. He was the judge during that time when Israel was being oppressed by the Philistines, and Samson was quite a guy. But Samson had a kryptonite in his life. Do you remember what it was? Excuse me? His hair. I probably shouldn't ask that question. That's true. But what was his kryptonite? What was it that distracted him? Beautiful women. It wasn't just Delilah. If you look at that passage, there was quite a few along the way. Beautiful women distracted him. The Corinthian church, if you look at 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, it tells us that the Corinthian church was distracted by fame and importance. See, they were supposed to be using their gifts in the church, and what were they doing? They were getting kind of proud of them. They were like, hey, look at me. I'm up here. I can speak in tongues. I can heal people. And they were distracted by their fame and their importance that they were using their gifts inappropriately. The same area talks about them being distracted at their times of communion feasts together. They got distracted. They weren't looking to Jesus anymore. They were all distracted by the wine and the food. So much so that they were getting drunk and gluttons. Right? What happened? They got distracted. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1, it says this, We must pay close and careful attention to what we have heard. Why? So that we do not drift away. Now, I'm not one, much of one for swimming in the ocean. I just kind of like to float. And um, my wife and I don't go to the ocean much because there are people there. But <laughs> if we could find a beach with no people, oh, Perfect. 
But I like to go out in the ocean and I'll grab a boogie board or something, just hang on to it. I just kind of float out there, you know, and I'm watching the seagulls and sometimes there's dolphins out there, right? And I'm catching a few waves and checking out the buildings and there are people throwing football. I'm kind of watching them. You know, I'm very distracted by what's going on, enjoying it for sure. And before long, I decide, well, maybe it's time to go in. Half hour goes by or what have you. And I look up and I'm thinking, wait a minute. I was right there. Donna was a big yellow striped umbrella and she was sitting there reading a book. She's not there anymore. Where did she go? You begin perusing the shoreline and you realize, oh, she's way back there. How did I get here when I started out way over there, right? What happened? I drifted. I drifted. It can be so easy to drift and become distracted, can it? Oh, you start off strong. You're on fire for the Lord. You're serving him. You wouldn't miss an opportunity to be in with his people. When the doors are open, you're there. And then something begins to distract you. Oh, you still love Jesus, but the fire is not quite as hot as it was. You serve, sort of, when it's really kind of an emergency situation, you'll step in. You come when you can, kind of when you feel like it. But you've drifted. You've drifted. And listen, the enemy will not distract us with things that don't appeal to us. And it's very different for everybody. But trust me, distraction is in the devil's wheelhouse. And he will use it as a strategy to draw you away. And that takes us actually to our second strategy this morning. He will seek to distance us. He seeks to distance us from each other and from Jesus. And that's what happens when you drift. When you're distracted and you begin to drift, and I look back, all of a sudden, I'm a lot farther away from Donna on the shore than I was just a half hour ago. i become very distant. Lions are fierce predators that often stalk their prey before attacking, and the attacks, in their attacks, they, call the, they cause the prey to panic and, and scatter and disperse, allowing for them to, to, to hone in on that one that's, that's weak, that one that has been distracted, that one that has becomes distant from the rest of the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the pack. And then they attack and they destroy. And I think about Peter who said, remember, oh God, I'll never deny you. There's no way I would ever deny you. They spent just a beautiful time in the upper room together as disciples. And then they go to the garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is arrested and what happens? Everybody scatters. They scatter. And it wasn't long after that, Peter's standing around the fire with strangers he doesn't know, and they start accusing him or that he's one of those disciples. What does he do? He denies them three times. How did that happen? He was distant. I meant you to say that if James and John were standing by that fire with him, there might have been a different response. But he was alone. He was distant from those that would encourage him. Hebrews chapter 10, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful and let us consider how we may spur one another up in in love and good deeds. Let us not give up the meeting of ourselves together as some are in the habit of doing. Isn't that interesting? It's not just a 2024 thing. This is the first century and already, uh, I don't need to go down to that house church today. I'm kind of tired, making bagels all night. We've had a long weekend. It's been busy. I'm just going to, I'm going to skip. I mean, they sing the same songs all the time anyway. I know what they're going to do. Kind of know what. And they give up meeting together because some were in the habit of doing that. So hear my heart here, okay? It's not healthy for your spiritual walk or that of your children to gather with God's people one out of six times a month. I'm speaking to the choir. The people that probably need that challenge probably aren't here. It's not healthy for us. The average attendance in our churches in America today is two out of every six weeks. They might make it. That's dangerous. 
Even in the first century, some were in the habit of doing this. It's so easy to, keep, to find a reason to keep Jesus out of the schedule. We fill our weekends with soccer games and soccer tournaments and lacrosse games and, and uh, weekend trips to the beach. Or we're just so tired from everything else we have to do this weekend that Sunday morning is the only time that we can kind of just get a break. And so we're just going to stay home. We're just going to stay in bed. And I love everything about what we're doing online, but that's the one thing. We give you an excuse sometimes. Why well, catch it online? I just... But I feel your pain. There's a lot to fit into our calendars and our schedules. It's not a legalistic thing here. It's a wisdom thing. To understand that what Satan wants to do, one of his strategies is to separate us. Amen. And if you do that, he can do some real damage. Satan wants to distance us, and and thirdly, he wants to discourage us. Have you ever felt discouraged to the point that you want to quit? Throw in the towel? And see, that's what will happen. If we become distant, if we become distracted, we will eventually start becoming discouraged because life's going to come at you. you got nobody around you to lift you up and to help you through. Discouragement in the life of Moses calls him to pray this. If this is how you're going to treat me, then just kill me. What about Elijah? Calls him to run from Jezebel. He's afraid of her. When he just had this amazing victory on Mount Carmel, he's afraid of a Jezebel. He runs and he's wished that he would just die. Jonah, discouraged by the mercy of God. Believe it or not. Can you believe that? He was discouraged because of God's going to show mercy. And he says, man, I just wish I were dead. And if the enemy can discourage you by your situation, he has a foothold to keep you from the will of God. Watch those things, distractions, distancing from each other, discouragement. And all of them are part of Satan's goal of having you simply disobey. He can get you in those spots. He can then lure you away. In our rooted study this week, we'll be uh, confronted with the idea of strongholds and the need to repent from them. Because here's the problem. The weak... When we are weak in our own strength and we have an enemy who desires to use that weakness against us and turn them into strongholds, they become our kryptonite. They become the thing that will rob your joy and it will keep you from all that God is intending for you to be. A stronghold is a character flaw, a sinful behavior, that wrong thought that has given the devil a foothold in your life. And it can be even something like anxiety and depression. They can be strongholds that he uses. Those are real things. I'm not minimizing them. Mental health is a real deal. We need to get help with it. But sometimes we need to lay that over to Jesus and say, listen, this is a stronghold in my life. It's keeping me back from everything you want for me. And I need your healing in that area of my life. Watch this. This is how it happens. You get distracted. You get distanced. You get discouraged. And the enemy gets a foothold as you crack that door open for disobedience. And why do you disobey? Because you're not feeling so good right now. You're distant. You're distracted. You're discouraged. And so this sin looks a little happy. Make me a little happy today. I'm just going to prop that door open just a little bit. That felt really good, but you know what? I know that's not right. I, I just left that door. A couple days later, still not feeling any different. So you know what? That, I'm just going to crack that door open a little bit again, just a little bit, because it feels pretty good at the moment. Oh, nope, I can't do that. I shut that door. Cracking of that door will become more frequent and more frequent in your life, and then all of a sudden, one day, you can't shut it anymore. Satan puts a foot in there. He's got a foothold in your door. And now everything about his lies are coming at you, and they're filling the room and affecting the air that you breathe. Most of us today, I would say, probably are living a fairly successful Christian life, and yet you have an area in your life where you struggle for victory. It's a stronghold. It's your kryptonite. And you know what it is. The enemy has you there. So what are we supposed to do? What do we do about it? What is the battle plan for victory in that area of my life? I want to take the last few minutes to answer that question just partially. And look at the battle plan for victory. Here's some things that I think we need to always be mindful of as we are fighting this battle as we walk through this life. What do I do about the strongholds in my life? What do I do about that kryptonite that's nagging me? It's nagging me for years. It's always been an issue. I just don't tell anybody about it. They think I'm okay. 
Here's a couple of things. Number one, we need to surrender to the will of God. Surrender to completely give up your own will and subjects your, subject your thoughts, ideas, and deeds to the will and the teachings of Jesus. Romans chapter 12 says, offer yourselves a living sacrifice. That's surrender. Matthew chapter 6, seek first the kingdom of God. Surrender. Matthew 16, whoever saves his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake, surrender. What does that look like? Well, my will is to watch that movie on Netflix. But God's will is for me to turn it off. My will is to get revenge, but God's will is for me to forgive and move on. My will is to tell everybody about this thing that I heard about this one person in our church, and I just can't even believe it. And so I got to tell everybody that I come in contact with and gossip away. God's will is probably for you to keep your mouth shut. We have to surrender. We have to turn over our will to his will. Secondly, we have to obey the words of God. The Bible says in Matthew 7, he who hears the words and does them, not just hears them, but he does them. It's like the wise man who builds his house on the rock. Matthew chapter 28, we talk about the Great Commission. He says, I want you to go and give them the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything that I've taught you. Teaching them, just teach them knowledge? No, teaching them to observe everything that I told. Have them obey and listen to the commands. Because when it comes to someone who loves you, obedience is not about having power over you. It is about the protection of you. That's important to understand. The word of God is not to be a killjoy. It's not about taking away your happiness. It's not about keeping you from having, a, keep, make you have a boring life. It's about protecting you. And his instruction for our protection. And when we don't obey, we make it harder for God to bless and protect us. Remember when I was, my kids were younger and maybe you did this as well. Or maybe when you were kids, you even remember, right? Dad, I want to watch that. Can I watch that show? Everybody, everybody at school is talking about it. I want to watch that show. <coughs> Dad, can I have apple pie and ice cream for breakfast? Well, maybe, but don't tell your mother. <laughs> Dad, I want to play. It's wintertime, and look at the pond. It's iced over. I want to play out there on the pond, and we know that it's thin ice. How's our, how do we respond? No, son, you cannot do any of those things because I would like to control you. Is that our attitude? No. No, my son, you can't do this because I want to protect you. From that which will harm you. Spiritual sons and daughters of high, listen, you and I have blind spots. We have blind spots. And sometimes we look at the word of God and we just don't see it. We have blind spots because we want to live the way we want to live. We want that stronghold. We like that stronghold. And when Jesus tells us something through his word, we got to understand it's about protecting us and blessing us. He says, do not steal, do not cheat. Well, you know, I'm going to fudge on my taxes because, you know, they're a bunch of crooks anyway. Okay, your free will. You do that, but just know you're dancing on thin ice. The word says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Well, I don't know if that really means that because I just love him so much. She's the most amazing girl I've ever met. Have you seen what's out there? There's not many choices. And she's amazing. She doesn't know Jesus. Okay. You have free will to go there, but just remember, you're dancing on thin ice. Paul tells us that our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit and we're to keep them pure. Well, that's, that's you know, it's just more convenient to just skip those verses. It's too complicated in our relationship. You don't understand. Okay. Okay. But just know you're walking on and you're dancing on thin ice. See, grace is not permission to continue in our sin. Grace is the opportunity to get it right before it's too late. 
It's not about, well, you know, we sing that song, God's grace is greater than all our sin. I'm so glad. My sin's pretty great, but God's grace is greater, so I'm okay. No. Grace is not about giving the opportunity to continue and permission to continue. No, it is about the opportunity to get it right before it's too late and the ice breaks. We need to obey the words of God. Thirdly, we need to yield to the spirit of God. The spirit of God is the atomic bomb in this battle. It is your silver bullet, if you will, okay? The game changer. Galatians chapter 5, it says, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. How is this different than surrender? I think there's a difference here in that surrendering to God's will is based on what we know through the Word of God. We know some of those things that we are supposed to do. Yielding to the Spirit often is in the moment. Things that come up in life that you have to decide, what is God's will in this? And sometimes it's not in black and white, but your spirit testifies with his spirit in you, and you make a decision that is honoring to God. And that's where the spirit testifies that in our lives. And you need to be listening. Dale had a great message the other week. Dale Marshfield, one of our our elders, about listening to the shepherd. Train yourself to hear his voice. In Colossians chapter 3, it talks about rules for a holy living. It really talks about our position in Christ, how we are seated with him. And it says this, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on those things, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then also you will appear with him in glory. So put to death, therefore, Whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, all those stuff. You used to walk in these ways in the life that you live, but now you must rid yourself of those things. Don't lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of the creator Paul's reminding us that we are seated positionally with Christ. He speaks to our identity with Christ. The fact that we don't have to be a slave to those things anymore. Listen, if you're going to gain victory, you need not only to know who the enemy is, but you need to know that you are in Jesus. You need to recognize that and understand that. And if I forget and ignore the fact that I am Christ in Christ, you know what? It doesn't take me very long to live like I used to live. It doesn't take very long. Because the flesh, it will come naturally. The flesh remembers, remember that. If you hear the words of God, surrender your will to him and yield to his spirit, it can give you victory every single time. But the battle's intense, isn't it? The battle is real. There's, some are extra intense. There's an extra difficulty to certain things in our life. And it creates a sense of bondage for us. A sense of a stronghold, right? It's that one thing, maybe two, but usually there's one thing that just... It's been nagging at you your entire Christian experience. Satan knows what it is to get to you, and now he gets to you with that one thing. So as we close our time this morning, I want us to take inventory. I want us to think about that stronghold that's beating you up right now. You know, for years, for me, it was idolatry. I spent more time working on Jesus than letting him work on me. Ministry, as is very much a a death trap for people in ministry, but the ministry itself, the activities of the ministry replace my spiritual acuity. In a word, it's idolatry. Which led to pride. I don't like to be wrong. I don't like to be wrong. I struggle to admit that I'm wrong. Just ask my wife. Simply put, pride. I used to think that if I wasn't in the room, the decisions, the direction, and the destiny of Church of the Open Door would suffer. How arrogant is that? It's a stronghold. What's your stronghold? What's your kryptonite? It's time to get hold of that. Maybe for you it's anger. Maybe it just doesn't take much. And man, you fly off the handle, you're from zero to 60 in a couple of seconds. 
you don't have a hold of that. It's a stronghold in your life. Maybe for you it's greed, covetousness. Some of you are more concerned about keeping up with the Joneses than keeping up with Jesus. It's consumed you. It's your stronghold. Sexual perversions are a stronghold. It takes many forms, but in the world in which we live, man, that's one of his most pointed arrows, most deadly arrows. Maybe for you, it's anxiety and depression. You haven't, you haven't given that over to Jesus. I know it's a, it can be a mental issue. I understand that. And counseling, all those things are true. But have you also allowed Jesus to take it? Have you trusted him with it? Doesn't mean you still won't battle. Listen, these strongholds don't go away overnight. There are things that will always be there. But you know what? You know that you've not really yielded to the spirit of God in this way. You haven't obeyed his word. You haven't surrendered to his will. And so that stronghold is front and center every single day of your life. Maybe for you it's addiction. Some sort. Lord only knows that that's one. I mean, Satan's. Well, what I say, he wants to seek to kill us. He's killing us to the tune of at least 100,000 a year right now in our country. Overdoses and addiction. Maybe that's a stronghold for you. Sometimes people chalk that stuff up. I was born that way. You weren't born that way. You were born a sinner just like everybody else. God can take these things from you. He can heal you of these things. Whatever it is, you know that you're being strangled by it. It's kryptonite for you. It's time to come to God with that. It's time to surrender your will to his will. It's time to obey the words that he says to us. It's time to yield to his spirit for victory in that area of your life. One of the rhythms of Rooted, which we focus on this week, is the the rhythm of repentance. Listen, repentance is not something you do just at the moment of salvation. Yes, we do repent at that time. But listen, it's a daily occurrence, or at least it should be. To repent is to to be walking in the Spirit. You hear from the Spirit, and then you repent. So to repent today of a stronghold in your life and turn it over to Jesus is not a sign of weakness. It's actually a sign that you're walking in the Spirit, and you're hearing from Him. You're turning around, and you decide to go in a different direction. Today would be a great day to nail that stake into the ground. So I'm going to ask you to stand with me. Both campuses, just stand with me for a second. And what I like to do is something we don't typically do, in a regular basis anyway, we do at times, but this is what I want you to do this morning because it's that important. I think that sometimes, you know, you just got to, you got to take a stand. You got to take a step, help get you in that journey a victory over some of these things. And so this morning, what i like us to do, and it's, it's crowded in here, and we don't have a lot of room here, so even if you step into the aisle, we just want you to, I just want you to move. And what that does, here's what that does. It's kind of like when Israel, God told Israel, like, listen, you know, I did something here, and I want you to build an altar. I want you to put some stones on a pile. So when you see that, you're going to remember it. That's what this kind of thing does. It nails it down for you. He says, you know what? I'm, I'm putting a stake in the ground. But that Sunday is when I began that journey of getting victory over that stronghold. And it allows us as a congregation, as your family, to pray for you and encourage you. We want to do that together. And so on both campuses, I'm gonna, we're going to sing a chorus for just a minute. And I'm going to ask you to just come. You say, you know what? There are things in my life I just want to bring and lay them at the feet of Jesus. I don't, we're not gonna. We're not gonna do a survey as to what your stronghold is. We're not taking you to a back room somewhere afterwards. No, nope. we just want you to come here. We're step into the aisle, and let Pastor Brett come right after we're done singing this. Course. He's gonna come up. He's gonna pray for us. Pray for all of you, especially those of you who've come and said, "Listen, yeah, I just want to lay this at the feet of Jesus today." That's an important thing to do. It's good for you to do, and we're behind you in it. In fact, I need to go there, so I'm gonna go down there first, and I hope you'll join me. Thanks for listening to Church of the Open Door Sermons Podcast. Church of the Open Door is based out of York, Pennsylvania, and we exist to help everyone discover life change through Jesus. For more information about Church of the Open Door or for locations and service times, be sure to visit us at codyork.org. Thanks again so much for listening.